now, finally, we get to that point all you engineers have been dying to deal with. We're going to take some data and take a look and understand what's actually happening. I know many of you just go grab data originally in the process and just start analyzing it, and that's what you tend to do. But what we want to do is we want to have a more logical approach to understanding data and describing to ourselves how good is this data and what does it really tell us about the process. So before we begin, let's take a look at some basics about collecting data samples. And so we're going to talk about population. So remember we described enumerative statistics. That's this thing where we have an Excel spreadsheet and all of the data versus sampling. And sampling tends to be what we call analytic statistics. This is where we take a small slice from the population that has some sort of logical coherence, and then we analyze that. We'll see there are different types of samples. And one thing we can use also is, is Minitab, and we'll talk about Minitab in the next two sessions, where we have different functions that help us with sampling. But one of them is if we have an Excel spreadsheet, we can actually take random samples from that using Minitab random sample from the columns as a function. So we'll talk about that when we talk about Minitab. We'll also talk about how we do what-if analysis to understand how good our sample is and how much risk that will help us to understand what is the quality of the sampling that we've done. Because many times we don't think about the quality of our sampling. But as a Six Sigma green belt, you need to be much more explicit. How good is my data is very important. And how well we sample is a very major contributor in terms of how good our data is and how well we can actually make choices about it. So let's begin. What's the difference between a population and a sample? Well, when statisticians talk about population and they talk about the measures, they talk about population parameters. And they talk about the parameter of the mean. It's the Greek letter mu, which is the measure of location. Standard deviation, or sigma, which is a measure of dispersion of the process. And then they talk about the number of the members of a particular population, and they use that as a large N, a capital Roman N, to talk about population size. Now, typically, we draw conclusions about subsets of populations, which we call samples. And the decisions that we make are usually based on sample statistics. Therefore, there's always going to be some uncertainty, like, where did that sample actually come from? And samples, then, not parameters, they have statistics. Okay, so we call a different thing what we talk about the measures of a sample. So we talk about the average, and instead of mu, we have x with a line over it, which we call x bar. Standard deviation is not sigma, it's a small Roman s. And sample size is not the capital N, it's the small n. So the question we have is, how representative is the sample that we have taken of the population from which it's drawn? In other words, if I make conclusions about that sample, will those conclusions be valid for the whole population? So sample is some subgroup that we have purposely selected out of a population, and we're going to use it to gain information, to make some sort of inference about what's going on. Now, we can have lots of different types of samples. Perhaps the worst, but most frequently used, is called opportunity samples. In one place I was at, they called it grab a sample. And the idea here is we don't really put much thought into what we're doing. We see some data, we grab it, we throw it into Excel, and we analyze it. Now, that's a convenient sample of the data. The problem is this does not assure that this, the assumptions that we need to make in order to apply statistical thinking are actually going to be there. Can we really use statistical tools with that sample of data and draw valid conclusions? So before we know anything about statistical analysis, what we have to do is first know, how has the sample been, been constructed? And we have to understand what are the assumptions that we have actually kept in this process. So we're going to use these samples in, in different ways. And so as we're looking at this, we, we need to understand some definitions. So perhaps think about how we're going to use it. Are we trying to use it for making a decision? Do I ship or don't ship? We call that acceptance sampling. Are we trying to make an estimation? How big is the problem going to be? Or is it discovery where we're doing an audit and we want to say, well, what is the magnitude of the problem? So each of these are talking about the same type of procedure, choosing a subset, some sample size n, 
from a population in order to make an inference about what's going on in the large population. One definition that we have to formulate is the idea of power and sample size. So the proper sample size gives power to the test. In other words, it means that we are making a conclusion or drawing a conclusion with minimal risk relative to this process. And so this is important to have this strong power test in terms of improving, controlling, and analyzing a process. And this is about the business risks in terms of a decision. So how much data that we select is one of the components. But also, do we protect the company and do we also protect the consumer that bad products won't escape to them? So we protect the company by making sure that we don't keep bad products, I mean good products inside the company, but we make them all available to ship. Now, the process of sampling needs to assure both of those conditions. So the very first step we have in sampling is make sure we have a rational subgroup. And that happens when we have a representative sample. So we will do a, a description of the overall outcome we deliver, and then we'll say, okay, what's different at the first level? So maybe we see there are three rational subgroups. If we're talking about a mobile phone, for instance, it might be due to the product itself. That's subgroup one. So that's the handset. Maybe it's the accessories and all of the other things that we put in the box, and that might be problems deal with rational subgroup number two. Or maybe it's the printed material and the advertising and the claims we make about it, and that is marketing material, which is subgroup three. So if we want to understand where are problems coming from the sale of a mobile phone, we have to conclude that it could be any one of those three rational subgroups, and then we have to look within each of them to understand what's going on. So if we want to draw conclusions, we have to make sure we have structured the sampling plan so it's representative of the type of information we'd like to draw a conclusion about. The more comprehensive we make that subgrouping, the more complex our sampling plan becomes. Now, there are different types of data samples. What we would typically like to have is a simple random sample. That's the best type. That means that data has been chosen in an unbiased and independent manner. Unbiased means that everything in the population has an equal opportunity to be selected. Independent means that if I choose one item out of the population, I'm not going back to the exact same place to choose a second one, but there's no influence in terms of my choice between the first item and each of the subsequent ones going into the sample. Now, statistical tests assume a simple random sample in order for the statistics to be valid. But there are lots of other types of sample we have that do not give us that unbiased independent set, this, uh, type of result. So for instance, a stratified sample may not be unbiased and independent. We have to make sure at the lowest level we achieve that, and then we have a good sample. Maybe we have a stratified random sample. That's better than just a stratified sample. That means from each of the subgroups at the bottom level of that representative sample, we will then draw that in an unbiased and independent manner. But then there are other types of samples, like a cluster sample. It's not unbiased, it's not independent, it's taken from a particular geographic or physical location. And so the subgrouping, we may take a, a cluster and it's always gonna be a final test. Okay, so that's not unbiased, it's gonna be coming through a process, it's got some structure to it. Uh, we may have this also uh, in, in politics, for instance, we take a look at sampling by location, by demography, age. Uh, we take a look at it by political party and so forth. So those are cluster samples. And again, variation within those samples is probably uh, much more common cause variation than variation between. If we take a look at two different political parties, say a liberal and the greens, we might see very much variation between them, but more consistency inside. And so we want to understand what's happening. So those two basic assumptions, randomization, all data in the population has an equal chance of being selected, and independence, that means that there's no relationship between the selection of one item and the selection of another item as a sample. Well, how do we void those two assumptions? Well, one way is systematic sampling. We always take five, we come back, we take five more. Well, within those five, there is no independence. They're all likely to be produced under the same conditions. 
And so they're not random either. They're all chosen. And if we have another pattern that we impose on that, like every 100 units, we then select one, we now have lost randomization. People in the process may tend to treat that golden phone or that golden product going through a production line a little differently. And so what we start seeing is we may have created a sampling bias. In other words, there's not an equal chance for the 99th unit to be taken. It's always the 100th unit. So sequential data so that one event looks a lot like the other creates a situation in statistics we call autocorrelation. And that is that the difference between the samples is not that unique. All the parts came from the same batch, from the same supplier, assembled by the same workers at the same time, with the same settings. And so what we've done is we've eliminated this process of bias. Now, how we detect differences is often shown as a truth table. A truth table is a two-by-two two matrix. And on the left-hand side, we say, are we properly shipping good products to customers? Yes or no. Or are we falsely rejecting processes to the customer? So, no, we're not, or yes, we are. So, we see that there's four different combinations. If we're shopping, if we're shipping good products to customers, it's okay. If we have a producer's risk, though, if we're shipping, not shipping good products to customers, in other words, falsely rejecting them, that's called alpha risk. Beta risk is when we ship bad products to customers. So that is the type of risk that the consumer is bearing because they are getting bad products. Now, if we don't ship bad products, that's supposedly okay according to statisticians because you made the right choice, but in reality, it's not okay. It's, we are shipping then no bad products. That means we have produced waste, and this is shareholders' risk. This is the risk from a process not performing properly to create the good product that we do ship to customers. So in the truth table, there's really only one place that's a good decision for our production process or any process, and that is properly shipping good products to our customers. Now, in analyzing this, we see there are four components. One component is delta. What is the difference we can detect in terms of the way we measure the process? So the difference we can detect can be measured as a standard deviation. I could measure a 1.5 standard deviation shift, or it could be in physical units, like millimeters or degrees centigrade. Alpha is the amount of risk that we have based on our decision criteria, or our p-value, and we'll come back and talk about that some more. But typically, we want to have an alpha risk of 0.05 that gives us a 95% confidence. The next factor is sample size, n. And sample size approaches population size, then we're going to see an inverse relationship with the final item. The final item is beta. Beta is the consumer risk. And as sample size gets bigger, beta approaches 100% risk to the customer. Ooh, we don't want to do this. So alpha is set usually in organizations based on financial risk aversion. Typically, we don't calculate beta or consumer risk, but it's a function of sample size, and it should be based on engineering risk sensitivity. But what happens is if we don't calculate beta, what happens? We don't manage the sampling situation right. It goes unmanaged, and what happens is we are transferring risk from the company, which is going to have this fixed risk, to the risk of the consumer. Now, how does this work? In this graphic, you see that uh, we have delta, which is how much difference we detect, and we have mu. And as the sample is changing from sample size, we see sample size of 30, this distribution gets much smaller. Sample size of 2, it gets much larger. So at smaller samples, we'll have bigger risk, if you will, that's happening. So you say, why don't we actually go to the full population? and get no risk in this process. Well, we see that there are some other problems we have. Here, in this next illustration, we see that there are two different distributions. And it's very difficult to tell, is there a statistically significant difference between the blue and the red distributions? However, if we have the sample size and we actually see there's a very big difference, we see now there's a very small illustration here of the overlap between the red and the blue distributions.
if those sample size is such that we have very, very discrete units, we see that the difference to detect can actually be much, much smaller. So it's easier to detect differences because the probability of drawing a large number of individuals from this non-overlapping area is actually relatively large for the sample sizes. So just to summarize, we saw that there's simple random sampling, listing all the units, we draw the units randomly, each unit has an individual chance of being uh, included in the sample. We can also have other types which are not really recommended. Stratified sampling, if we don't have random sampling at the lowest level, might give us a bias. Cluster sampling might give us a geographic orientation that might be biased, and systematic sampling almost always is biased. Now, when we put together a sampling plan, this is our choice. How are we actually going to get the data? So what we want to understand is, first of all, what's the quantity of the data? So the samples should be taken in a representative way. They should be randomly selected. They should be independent. We should choose the difference to detect and the sample size so that we get the right power of the test. And that's a balance between alpha risk to the company and beta risk to the consumer. And then we should follow that sampling process rigorously in the real world to make sure that our decisions are right. So we begin by selecting the alpha risk, select the beta risk, select delta, which is typically done by the measurement system, determine the sampling size, and then develop that sampling plan. Now, the last graphic. This is the summary of what happens. We see four factors can be affecting our process. We see alpha, we see beta, delta, and sample size. Now what really happens in the real world is we choose alpha typically based on contracts to the customer or to the company. We say we want a 95% confidence interval. That sets alpha. Delta is set because we bought a measurement system. It's got a certain measurement capability. And so we define that. And so we've say, created two constants. And then what happens with these four factors, when we have two constants, the other two are inversely related. So what happens is, as sample size goes up, beta, the risk to the customer, goes down. But as sample size goes down, beta, the risk to the customer, goes up. Well, the problem is, most managers, thinking about efficiency, say, limit your sample size. And without knowing it, what they've actually done is they've transferred risk from the company to the customer. Now what we're going to see in the next video is how Minitab has a what-if analysis capability to help us to understand what this trade-off is really doing and to see what the impact of it. Then after that, we'll talk about how adequate are samples relative to populations. And both of these next two sessions we'll be doing in Minitab and we'll understand, using some data that's, that's just there for illustration purposes, what we can do in terms of improving our capability at taking random samples.